All right, my friends, thank you so much for coming back and joining me again this week. Um, you have joined Cast Rock CBS class, and we are studying the Gospel of John, and I am the teaching director of the CBS Cast Rock class. Um, so we are in, this week, chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, and what we find in this chapter is a divine encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. And there is a lot in this chapter, so I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to open this in prayer, and then I'm going to jump right into it. So join me for a second as we pray. Father, we just ask you to go before us. Um, Father, you are the God who reigns supreme. You are the God. These words that were written on this in the Bible and the scriptures that we are looking at today, those are about you. And so, Father, I ask that you would illuminate it, that you would open our understanding, that you would... Um, set fire to the words on the paper. Your your um, word tells us that nothing, the scripture will never return to you, you void. And so we say, Lord, have your way in us today. May your word do what it is intended to do in each and every life who listens to this lecture today. Father, may you do the work of salvation in us. May you do the work of sanctification in us. May you work in and through us. And Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So now we have a meeting. It's between Jesus and Nicodemus. And it is just much more than an encounter between two religious uh, figures. It is a collision between two philosophies, two opposing views on salvation. And Nicodemus thought that the person did the work of salvation. But Jesus says that God does the work of salvation. So these two views encompass all views. All world religions can be placed in one of these two camps, legalism or works or grace. So a legalist believes that the supreme force behind salvation is you. If you look right, if you speak right, if you belong to the right group, then you will indeed be saved. The brunt of the responsibility doesn't lie with God, it lies with you. But Jesus says, Spirituality and the new birth doesn't come from church attendance or good deeds or correct doctrine, but it comes from heaven itself. Salvation is God's business. Grace is his idea. It is his work and it is at his expense. So why would God do this? Why would he give us such an incredible gift of grace? Why? Because of his great love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. So let's look at this divine encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. So our first division is verses 1 and 2 in chapter 3, and Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the dark. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, last week in John uh, chapter 2 at the very end, verses 24 and 25, Jesus said that he did not entrust himself to those who believed only because of the signs that they saw him do. He didn't entrust himself to them because he understood their heart. And in John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night, and Jesus saw right into the heart of Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus believed that Jesus was a teacher and that God was with him. Why? Because of the miraculous signs that he had done. So his belief was shallow, and his faith was not in Jesus Christ as Messiah, but rather Nicodemus had placed his faith in his own self-righteousness and, and works. But he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. He came to Jesus in the dark of the night, but in his dark of understanding, Jesus used that opportunity to point him to the light. And Jesus pointed Nicodemus to the transforming nature of true saving faith, to be born again. So, Verse 1 tells us that Nicodemus was a member of the elite re, uh, religious party, the Pharisees. They were a political and they were a religious group that had earned the respect of the fellow Jews because of their great zeal and devotion to the law. 
So they taught the scripture, and then they also worked tirelessly to try to apply the general principles of the law to everyday life. And it's ironic, but it was their very zeal for the law that caused them to become very ritualized and, and external and um, legalistic and works-based. So, for example, the law stated that every Israelite was to set aside the seventh day of the week for resting the body and refreshing the soul. And so that everyone would know exactly how to apply that law and how to rest in the right manner, the Pharisees added a long list of specific prohibitions. And later this became an oral tradition of the Pharisees that was preserved in a document that is called the Mishnah. And that contains 24 chapters on just on how to keep the Sabbath. So no one rivaled the Pharisees in being religious. And no one could. But I want you to hear this. Because religion and legalism, it cannot change the heart. It only masks the true condition of the heart. It is an outward display of self-righteousness. So now Jesus says that he is, or um, describes um, Nicodemus as a teacher of Israel or a ruler of the Jews. So not only was Nicodemus a devoutly religious man, but he was also a leader of religious men. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the governing council of Israel. So the fact that Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin could possibly explain why he came to Jesus at night. He might not wanted to. Uh, he may not have wanted to risk the disapproval of his fellow Jews, or it is also possible that he was sent by his peers to talk to Jesus privately. Or there is a third possibility as well, and this is the one I want to believe is the case that he actually came in all sincerity to find out more about Jesus. But how he came or why he came, it's not the important point. The point is, is that Nicodemus came. He came to Jesus. And I want you to know that coming to Jesus is a necessary beginning for all salvation. Coming to Jesus is a necessary beginning for salvation, period. So in verse 2, it says that, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from uh, you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things uh, these signs that you do. <clears throat> excuse me, unless God is with him. So Nicodemus addresses Jesus using that respectful term or title, Rabbi. He addresses Jesus though as an equal. He acknowledges that Jesus has come from God, but he doesn't he doesn't believe or understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Rather, he sees Jesus as rabbi or teacher. Nicodemus, he believed in the undeniable power that Jesus had manifested in his miracles. He believed that those were all divine. But faith placed in signs and wonders results only in superficial faith. And Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand and experience genuine faith. And so Jesus went straight to the real issue. Nicodemus needed a transformed heart. And that only could come by being spiritually reborn, a new birth. So to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus did what um, those who are seeking must do. That is, he came to Jesus. And coming to Jesus is a necessary beginning for salvation. So if you are seeking, then come to Jesus. And, and you do that through prayer and through God's word, and you ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scripture and lead you to understanding, and he will do those things. Some of us, we've placed our our faith in Jesus, and we have been born again. But there are things in scripture that puzzle us, that we don't fully understand. And so what do we do with that? We come to Jesus. We ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scripture and lead us into understanding. And he will. He'll do those things. And then that takes us into our second division. Where Jesus speaks to the heart of the matter. In verse 3. Jesus answers Nicodemus. And he says to him. Truly, truly, I say to you. Unless one is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Jill had mentioned in a previous lecture. That truly, truly. Where it's repeated. Oftentimes in scripture it's truly. And it goes into the point, but here it's truly, truly. And it appears only in John's gospel. 
But what the, the meaning or intent of it is, is to gain the full attention of the listener. He's saying, truly, truly, listen up now. This is important. And he used this phrase to introduce the vitally important truth that there is no entrance into God's kingdom unless one is born again. So the new birth or the regeneration, it is an act of God, which he gives eternal life to those who are spiritually dead because of their sinful state. And he makes them spiritually alive, a new birth and his children. So now kingdom of God, Jesus said that you must be born again to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, because of his old te- uh, knowledge of the Old Testament, he would have been familiar with this idea of God's kingdom. It's interesting that the subject of the kingdom of God was central in Jesus' teaching, yet nowhere in Jesus uh, did Jesus exactly say what the kingdom of God was. But if we look at the scripture in whole, the entirety, Old Testament, New Testament, together, Throughout the Bible, we see that the kingdom of God is truly just the rule of God. It's not a territory over which he reigns, because he reigns over everything, right? But rather, it's the rule which he exercises. So the person who seeks the kingdom of God seeks God's rule in his life. And the person who receives God's kingdom receives God's rule in his life. Now, it's not by works, it's by grace. And this is where the rubber meets the road because to enter the kingdom of God requires spiritual rebirth. And it is solely an act of God, divine intervention and divine transformation. The implications of Jesus' words, it must have blown Nicodemus's mind. As a Jew and especially as a Pharisee, he would have eagerly anticipated the kingdom of God But he thought because he was a descendant of Abraham and because he observed the law and because he, um, he performed all the external rituals that was required, all those acts of self righteousness would have gained entrance. It would have gained him entrance into the kingdom of God. But religion and good works and religious traditions, it does not result in salvation. Spiritual birth, It is something that someone undergoes. Um, It's not something that we can produce. It's something that God does within us. Excuse me. (coughs) Excuse me. Jesus made it very clear that no matter how religiously active someone might be, no one can enter into the kingdom without experiencing the personal regeneration, which is a new birth, right? Born again. So in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. <clears throat> now that Greek word translated again, it's commonly, uh, commonly rendered as uh, from above. So what he's saying is that you must be born again. You must be born from above. It's God's work, right? Nothing we can do here, but it's God's work alone. Throughout all of Nicodemus's life, he had diligently, uh, diligently observed the law and the rituals of Judaism. He joined the Pharisees, ultra-religious Pharisees. He became a member of the Sanhedrin. And now Jesus is saying to him that he has to forsake all of that and start over. To abandon that entire system of works righteousness in which he had placed all of his hope in. And he had come to the realization that human effort was powerless to save. What a blow for Nicodemus. This rabbi, Jesus from Galilee, calmly tells him that he's not yet in the kingdom and all of which he has built, his hopes were worthless. So you must be born again, born from above to enter the kingdom of God. You know, it's really difficult for someone who is morally upright who is religious, who follows the rules and considers themselves a good person to become a Christian. Because in order to be born again, we have to come to the realization that we are indeed a sinner, that we have missed the mark, we have missed God's standard, and that the only way that we can be saved from that, that we can be redeemed from that, is by someone higher, someone greater, and that's God. 
That is God. That is his son, Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that there is no one beyond the saving grace of God. And so you and I who are praying for those that are really good people, but are still lost, we pray on because God can save. But there are also some of us as, as Christians who we continue to live under the burden of legalism and law. You know, Christ has come to set us free. His love for us is so great. It is so great that you don't have to earn his favor. The truth is that when you are a child of God, Christ has done it all. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And I want you to hear there's, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. So my friends, walk in freedom. Cultivate the love relationship that you have with the Lord. You will then display outwardly all that wonderful transformation that he has done in you inwardly. So now we move into our third division, and it's a new birth, a new beginning. And that is in John 3, 4 through 8. And it says that Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So now that conversation, it becomes real as Nicodemus asks, How can this be? Nicodemus understood that the Lord wasn't talking about being physically reborn. His real question to Jesus was, How could he start over? How could he go back to the beginning? And so Jesus was telling him that the entrance to God's salvation, it wasn't a matter of adding something to all of his efforts, but rather it's a matter of canceling everything and starting all over again. It's a new birth, a new beginning. Jesus was asking for something that was not humanly possible to be born again. And clearly he stated that the interest in the kingdom is contingent on something that cannot be obtained through human effort. It had to come from above. So now you can almost imagine Nic Nicodemus pondering these things, um, pondering the spiritual truths that he's hearing. If a spiritual rebirth was impossible from a human standpoint, then where did this lead, this self-righteous Pharisee? So in verse 4, Nicodemus asks, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time? into his mother's womb and be born. When Nicodemus heard that new requirement must be born again, he focused on the again nuance of the phrase. So Jews in, in that day, they called Gentile converts to Judaism newborn children. And, that, and um, that described their new life as sons of the covenant. Male converts were required to be circumcised and all converts were baptized in water. And so Jesus responds to his question. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So by connecting the two concepts, the concepts of born again and born of water and the spirit, this would have sparked Nicodemus's memory of the Old Testament um, promise that we've, we read of um, in our lesson, but it's found in Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. And I'm going to read it because I love this passage, but it says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries, and then I will bring you into your land. I will sprinkle you with pure water, and you will be clean from all your impurities. I will purify you from all your idols. This is God speaking. He says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your body and give you a heart of flesh. I, God speaking again, will put my spirit within you and I will take the initiative and you will obey my statutes and clearly observe my regulations. And then you will live in the land I gave to your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. What a tremendous promise. So Jesus is saying to, to Nicodemus and to us today that human beings, the flesh, can only produce more human beings. Only God, the divine spirit, can give the believer spiritual life. Flesh produces flesh. Spirit produces spirit. And at the same time that God puts his spirit into us, 
We are given a new, regenerated human spirit. He removes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. It is God's spirit, not our effort, that makes us children of God. And so Jesus showed that regeneration or the new, new birth, it was an Old Testament truth. And without that spiritual washing of the soul, a cleansing accomplished only by the Holy Spirit through the word of God, no one then can enter the kingdom of God without that. So religion is man-made. Nicodemus didn't misunderstand Jesus' imagery, but Jesus' words just ran contrary to everything that he had been taught. For his entire life, he had believed that salvation came through his own external merit, through religion and good works. So aware of his astonishment, Jesus continues. He says, do not be amazed that I said this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now just imagine, for perhaps for a moment in the evening, there was a soft wind that rustled the leaves outside of the house where they were talking. And Jesus uses that illustration of the wind to depict the effect of the Spirit in the person that is born of the Spirit. That Greek word, um, wind, pneuma, can have several meanings. It can mean spirit, wind, or breath. God's spirit, like the wind, has free movement and is like reviving breath. And it has power to transform. So Jesus used this illustration to show that the reality of the spirit in a person is evidenced by the effect of the spirit on the, in the person's life, in that person's life. So people can control, or well, I should say, people can't control the wind or even the movement of God's spirit. So to enter the kingdom of God, we must be born again. So at the same time that God puts a spirit in us, we are given a new regenerated human spirit. It's God's spirit, not our effort that makes us children of God, that allows us entrance into the kingdom of God. So as a child of God, it's God's spirit that continually works in and through us. And that continual work of the Holy Spirit, it's called sanctification. It's a process of being more like Christ. And our response to the Holy Spirit should always be have your way. Just have your way. You know, we have not been saved from condemnation. Um, we have not just been saved from condemnation. We have indeed been saved from condemnation. But what we have been also is saved into a new life. And so allow the Holy Spirit to have free access into every area of your life. He will indeed transform you inside out. As you allow the Holy Spirit to have his way, you will experience a life that is lavish, abundant, and totally unexpected. That is the work of the Spirit. So then our last division is um, verses 9 through 15. And I titled it, Look Up and Believe. Because new birth is found in, in Christ alone. So Nicodemus now says to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus, um, Jesus answers him and he says, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. He calls him the teacher of Israel and he expresses amazement at his lack of understanding as a teacher of Israel. This Jewish teacher of the Bible knew the Old Testament thoroughly. But he didn't understand what it said about the Messiah. I want you to remember this because it is true for you and I that knowledge is not salvation. We can know all kinds of things about scripture. But unless we've allowed it to penetrate our hearts and unless we've come on bended knees believing and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it is just knowledge. It's not salvation. And Nicodemus, he didn't accept the truth to which Jesus testified. And why? Because he just refused to believe it. And we do the same. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things, Jesus said. So Jesus gave Nicodemus an illustration from nature on an earthly analogy, which was the wind, right? And if Nicodemus could not understand that, how could he understand, much less believe, when Jesus told him of heavenly things? But Jesus, he didn't give up on Nicodemus. He goes on to explain in verse 13, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended 
from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, Jesus answers the question of credibility and authority here. Nicodemus could believe all that Jesus was telling him because everything that Jesus spoke, it was based on personal experience. Jesus came from heaven. Heaven was the home that he left on his mission to rescue us. No other man could make this claim. And then in verse 13 and 14, to illustrate how re regeneration or new birth takes place, Jesus compared his coming death to the story that was well known to Nicodemus and is recorded in Numbers 21, uh, verses 4 through 9. But in, in the, uh, uh, um, Numbers 21, 4 through 9, the Israelites had just experienced God's miraculous deliverance from slavery from Egypt. They had experienced the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, and they had the pillar of the cloud and the uh, pillar of fire at night um, that led them through the wilderness. And all this, still they began to grumble and complain. And so God disciplined his children, and he sent venomous snakes. And in their desperation, they begged Moses to intercede on their behalf. And so Moses prayed, and God answered, and he did answered with a display of divine grace and mercy. He instructed Moses to make a bronze replica of a snake and to raise it um, on a pole above the camp. And so as the people were bitten by the snakes, they would look up to the pole and they would be healed. That act of looking up was an expression of faith in God's forgiveness and his healing power his ability to deliver or to save them. So we need to look up and believe. So Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, and Jesus says, So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now this is the critical moment. This is the truth, and we cannot miss it. We must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Hear the Lord say to you in this moment, truly, truly, he needs our undivided attention for the salvation truth. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, must be lifted up. Christ's death was a necessary part of God's plan of salvation. Jesus had to die as a substitute for sinners because scripture makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22. The Israelites were forgiven and saved by looking up in faith. In the same way, you and I are forgiven of our sins and saved as we in faith look up and believe in Jesus Christ. It is then that we have eternal life. And we have now gained entrance into the kingdom of God. I want you to hear clearly, it's not obtained by works or religion, but it is solely by the grace of God who loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, not to condemn you, but so that you might be saved. And when you have looked up and believed, you then become a child of God. John, uh, 1 John 4, 1, one of my favorite verses. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So to be a part of the kingdom of God, to gain entrance into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And truth has been given now. It has been given to Nicodemus and a response is required. Now, you know, there is nothing in the passage that suggests that Nicodemus was converted that evening. But he never forgot his discussion with Jesus. Later, he boldly defended Jesus before the Sanhedrin. And he helped Joseph of Amarathia prepare his body for burial. Those actions indicate there was a presence a genuine faith in his life, a transformation, a new birth. So sometime after that memorable evening, Nicodemus came to understand the sovereign grace and experience the reality of the new birth. And therefore, he gains entrance into the kingdom of God. So I want you to know that today, truth has been given. And when truth is given, a response is required. This was true for Nicodemus and is true for you and I today. We must 
be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And the first step to become born again is you have to come to Jesus. You have to come to Jesus. When you come to the holy presence of God, when you come to Jesus, you will acknowledge, you will see the sin that has kept you separated and will continue to without the saving grace of God. You cannot rely on religion or good works. You have to be born again. So come to Jesus. Acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And at the time that you believe and receive the Holy Spirit, or believe and receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and breathes into you a new life. Salvation comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. So look up and believe. This week, no matter what you face, now I want all those who hear that do not know the Lord to look up and believe. But I want all of you also who are children of God, who in these times are struggling because it, it just seems like things are falling apart. In those moments of desperation, I want you to look up and believe. Because Jesus Christ reigns from on high. He reigns here on the earth. He reigns in your heart. He is in control. So look up and believe. Let me close in prayer. Father, I am so grateful for your word. And the truth of your scripture, that we just have to look up, that you are our redeemer, you are our deliverer, you are our provider, you are all the things that we need in this moment in time. For those who don't know you as Abba, Father, Father, may the truth that has been spoken today penetrate their hearts, and may you replace a heart of stone with a heart of with a heart that is devoted to you. Would you set your seal upon them? Would you guide them into this new life? And then, Father, for all of the, everyone that we would know this week that you indeed reign, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would make your sh face to shine upon them, and that you would give them peace. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, my friends, thank you so much for coming and come back next week. May God richly bless you this week and may you know and may you be a child of God. May you know him. Thank you.